I could have stayed there forever. It was unconditional love. It was amazing. Just no judgment, this acceptance, just this, this amazing, amazing love. And I received that and just took it all in. And then I heard Archangel Michael speak. This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And today, my guest is Wendy Williams. Hello, Wendy. Hello, Heather. It is wonderful to have you here today. I so appreciate you coming. Oh, thank you so much for having me as your guest. I really appreciate it. It's, it'll be interesting to hear your story. You actually had a couple of near-death experiences, and they both occurred while you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. So why don't you take us first through the first one, and you're in the bathroom, you're pregnant, and suddenly you have all these angels around you. Yes. So what happened, it was August of 1997, and I was newly pregnant. I'd had just one visit to the OBGYN. And I was working at home alone and I just didn't feel right um, that day, Heather. So I had run into the bathroom thinking, am I going to be sick? What's wrong? And all of a sudden it just felt like um, it was the searing pain in my abdomen. It felt like an organ burst is the only way I can describe it. And I passed out on the floor. So I was home alone. And the only reason I came to was because there was this insistent male voice that uh, brought me brought me out of um, th that that state. I had passed out, and he just kept saying, "Wendy, Wendy, you've got to wake up now, or you're going to go home." So I opened my eyes, and I was disoriented because I'm laying on my side, and I looked up. Um, and Heather, it just, it changed my entire belief system because the bathroom was filled with four or five angels and they were so loving. They were so powerful. They were so huge. There was so much light coming uh, from them that I couldn't clearly see their faces, but I could clearly uh, I just knew that they were angels and I could sense um, their wings um, even. They were floating just a couple inches off the floor and I could sense where their wings curled up at the bottom. So he repeated this message and I said, I, I understand. And I knew what he meant that I was going to die if I didn't get help. And my response was, I understand, but I, I can't walk. And what he said to me was, just, it was compelling. I think it was an answer on multiple levels. And he said, you just have to be willing to try. And I think he was referring to not only we've got to be willing to do our own work. There's no magic wand. You know, we cannot, we cannot call on, on, on God or angels or any outside entity to change our life and make everything better and, you know, fix everything. We've got to just put in the effort, even when it's really, really hard. And I also think he was referring to free will because again, no one can come in and just magic wand, <laughs> change our, change our life for us. So I managed to get up on my hands and knees uh, with a lot of effort. And at that point, again, my belief system just changed so much because it was like being just gently moved. It's like I was gently flown to the nearest uh, landline because this was back in 1997 and we didn't have, you know, cell phones like glued to our hand or glued in our back pocket like we tend to do now. And I had to get to a landline. So I was brought to the nightstand um, next to the bed and I was reaching up trying to trying to grab the phone because I was still on the floor. And I did have the thought of who should I call? He didn't say who to call. <laughs> if there was ever a time to call 911. But hey, I was a healthy 36 year old woman. I'd never called 911. So it just didn't enter my mind. So I chose to call my husband at work. And I knew he worked just five minutes from home, which was very unusual. 
and I got him immediately on the phone. So definitely angels were on my side. I have never reached my husband at work <laughs> like that, you know, immediately. And I give him a lot of credit because all I said to him was, I need you to drive me to the hospital now. Can you take me now? And all he said was on my way. And I could hear the, the phone slam down on his end. So I called the doctor's office. I told them what was happening. And I told them that my abdomen was distending because they asked me if there was any, any bleeding. I said, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not bleeding uh, like you, you would think with a miscarriage. But I said, my abdomen's just getting bigger and bigger, and I'm in excruciating pain in my abdomen. So they said, that's great. Your husband's on the way to get you because he'll get you here faster than 911 at this point. So when you get here to our office, and my OB office was located at the hospital, which I think was also great good fortune for me. And what the physician office told me was, don't try and park the car, just pull up curbside, we'll be waiting for you with a wheelchair, we don't want you walking. It's like, okay, so that's exactly what happened. They whisk me up to their office and get me up on the ultrasound table. And at that point, again, I am just writhing in pain. I'm in a fetal position. I can't even get myself up on the table. So they tried to do an ultrasound and I'm looking at the screen and I'd had ultrasounds before. I mean, you can, you can see a lot on them, uh, but I just wasn't seeing anything. <laughs> Said to the ultrasonographer, is that on? Is your machine working? And her answer was, I'm going to get the doctor now. So she returns very quickly with a physician as well as with a nurse midwife. And the physician adjusts the, the machine and he realizes what's going on. And he just tells me as kindly as he can, Wendy, you've got a major abdominal bleed going on. I can't visualize anything. I can't see where it's coming from, but that's why you're in so much pain. That's why your abdomen is distending like this. And the, the ultrasound's working perfectly, but that's all blood. What you're looking at, that whole screen is full of blood that's not where it should be. So we need to admit you to the hospital uh, right now. So someone ran and got a stretcher. They didn't even want to move me via wheelchair and took me straight over to the hospital, got me into a bed um, in the GYN, on the GYN floor. And I noticed they put me next to the nurse's station. And Heather, I worked in healthcare. So I, I was kind of seeing more than the, the average person would see. And I knew that meant they were really concerned about me because they're putting me right next to the nurse's station. And they asked me my blood type, said, do you know your blood type? I was like, of course, everyone should know their blood type. I said, it's A negative. So I can hear the, the nurse. So I've got, you know, various personnel in there with me. And one goes out to the nurse's station to call the Puget Sound Blood Bank to get some blood there for me. And it's a regional blood bank to not, not waste blood. Um, and she comes back in a few minutes later, not looking happy. And she tells us that she can't get any A negative blood from the blood center because there had evidently been a major train collision a few days earlier um, in the Seattle area and they had used up all the um, A negative blood. So she goes back out. There's, there's a brief discussion. Should we be going um, straight to surgery? Uh, what do we do? But we don't have blood. We don't know what we're operating on. I'm pregnant. So the decision is made. And I was very much a part of that decision and happy with it. And so we uh, made the decision to watch and wait. And I was to stay just lying prone in the bed and not, I couldn't get up even to go to the bathroom and have to call the, call the nurse for, for a bedpan. So they were able to get uh, blood for me about six or seven hours later um, and hung the bag. And I could see I was just going through it very, very rapidly. And I still was in so much pain. I had blown through uh, the, you know, the, they're trying to give me like a little bit of Demerol, trying to, and that's a big decision, you know, your first trimester of pregnancy, but there just was no choice. So I'm now on morphine and I'm still um, in so much pain, um, including from the, from the IV, because I know they've got it 
cranked all the way up because they need to get that blood in as quickly as possible because I'm losing it so quickly. And Heather, one of the other things that really concerned me was I could feel myself walking between worlds. It was very hard to remain conscious. It was very hard to answer questions intelligently when um, the, the various uh, hospital personnel would come in and, and, and check on me. And what concerned me with that was I didn't really care. That is not my personality. But I, I have always been just very, very uh, motivated, you know, strong willed, persistent, you know, just just a lot of a lot of uh, get up and go um, in life and with with challenges. So that that concerned me and I could feel myself making the decision at, at some, you know, some level. Uh, whether I was gonna gonna stay, and on the third day, uh, my physician said to me, "Wendy, you probably know this, but you're, you're you're bleeding out. You're officially bleeding out. We can't we can't transfuse uh, blood quickly enough because you're losing it, you know, somehow, uh, so profoundly, and we need to do surgery. So, uh, will you agree to surgery and you know sign sign the forms and let's let's get that scheduled? So I said yes. I, you know, I can see there's no there's no other choice. Again, this is not what you want going on during your your first trimester, uh, but there just there just was no choice. So after I've signed the paperwork, um, there is some feeling of relief because I've made this really hard decision. And it was after it was after uh, dinner time, so I'm trying to relax. It's around five o'clock in the evening. I'm by myself in the hospital room. I'm just trying to visualize the best possible outcome the next morning. I also noticed they'd scheduled me for seven a.m. I was going to be the first surgery of the day, so I'm trying to visualize uh, the best outcome. And the minute I have that thought, I pop right out of my body. And I'm above my body in the hospital. And I look back over my left shoulder and I'm like, wow, she is a hot mess. She's whiter than the sheets. And look at her hair. She looks like the wild woman of Borneo. <laughs> I had this kind of brief, brief laugh because, of course, you know, there's been no mirror. There's been no hairbrushing going on for the last couple of days. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Why, why am I, who, who am I? Why am I referring to that body in the bed as, as, as she, as her, you know, that's not me. Cause I'm, I'm in pure soul form. I feel great. I feel wonderful to be out of that body. I'm not in pain anymore. I'm not scared. I can feel more of my energy coming back. And I'm like, oh, that's just, that's Wendy. That's just Wendy Rose Williams. I mean, yes, it's the body is very important because it's the housing for my soul for this one lifetime, but it's certainly not, you know, who I am. So again, I look, I look at myself um, in the bed and I go, ah, she's fine. <laughs> so it's just so blase because the soul is just, you know, revving to go and wants to go up to the light because I can see, I can see the light. There's this beautiful like triangle of light coming down and through, through the ceiling of my hospital room. And it was compelling. I was so sparkly. It was so inviting, just, just calling me to go up and explore and to go on home. So I did. So I followed it. I leave my body um, in that soul form and go on up. And I, I go very quickly um, out through the roof of the hospital. And I look down at the earth briefly because I'm starting to travel more and more quickly um, up to the light to go back home. And I, I did see the earth at one point. I thought, oh, she's so beautiful. We've got to take better care of her. I had that thought very quickly. And then it's like, oh, I got to keep going. But all of a sudden, it was like stuttering to a stop. If you've ever run out of gas in your car, you know, that horrible feeling of like, oh, no, I'm all the way. I'm all the way out of gas. And it just it just stutters to a stop.
So that's what my, my soul did. And I'm like, Oh, I can't go any further. I don't, I don't have any energy. I hope they don't make me walk through one of those long tunnels. Again, this is 1997. I didn't know really anything about near death experiences. It wasn't like nowadays where these, you know, marvelous books and podcasts and documentaries and it just was a different a different time but the minute i have that thought of please don't make me walk through that tunnel i don't have enough energy this pristine escalator just drops in right in front of me and i'm so grateful so i plop myself on this escalator there's no one else on it there's so much light coming from it and because i plopped myself on the escalator i could tell what my 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 form was like at that time i knew i should have been like a beach ball of all this uh, sparkling um energy um in pure soul form like like a like a large orb more the size of a, of a beach ball but instead i was over the handrail on the escalator and i was like flatter than a pancake i'm like hanging over <laughs> the uh, rail but it just takes me up and up and up and i was like oh thank you for the ride when i get to the top of the escalator there's this wonderful uh, committee, the group just waiting for me. They clearly knew I was coming. And there's this welcoming committee. And it's my soul group. And I also see and I hear and I sense the angels, the same angels that were in my bathroom, four or five of them, they're in the back. And I can tell they're angels because they're larger and there's more light coming from them. But my soul family of 18 or 20 um individuals is there and they're all like i like i described how i should have looked like these beautiful uh sparkly um just beach ball size orbs of, of powerful energy i knew exactly who they were even though they looked all the same and that just made me um realize gosh these these distinctions we have around race and gender they, they make zero sense just let them go um, cause we're all exactly the same. We're, we're souls. We're souls on a, on an incredible, incredible journey. And I get this huge hug. I get stopped at the top of the escalator. I wanted to just keep on running. Yes. I wanted to interact with everyone that was there, but I just wanted to go home. I wanted to go all the way home. I couldn't wait to be there and to just explore everything again and just feel it. But I get this hug and this hug from the group. I could have stayed there forever. It was unconditional love. It was amazing. Just no judgment, this acceptance, just this, this amazing, amazing love. And I received that and just took it all in. And then I heard Archangel Michael speak. And the moment he spoke, I'm like, oh, that's who was in my bathroom. Because I do remember calling out to God for help as I was going down um, in the bathroom and as I was uh, falling unconscious. And what he said was, welcome home. We're so glad you're here. You've done nothing wrong. You're welcome to stay. I'm like, well, of course I'm staying. <laughs> I'm getting this unconditional love and I'm back with my soul group and I'm with angels. Why the heck would I do anything else? And he continued. He said, but you're going to need to make a decision quickly. And I kind of flash back to my body in the bed and I'm like, oh, yeah, obviously that's not viable for very long at all. And he said, uh, Michael continued, he says, I can tell you three things to help you make your decision. Number one, if you choose to go back, you will have a successful surgery tomorrow and you will fully regain your health. So it's like, ah. Oh can feel some incredible weight of the world coming off me because of course I'm very concerned about that. Number two, if you choose to go back, your baby will be born healthy. Oh my goodness. This is also huge because to have gone through all this at just 10 weeks of pregnancy, I was very concerned um, about, about my child. 
and number three. So now I'm like, Ooh, Oh, but it's so perfect here. Oh, but he's telling me really important things. Should I go back? Now I'm thinking about it. Oh, maybe I want to go back. Number three was the kicker. And what Archangel Michael said was, if you choose to go back, your life will be very difficult, likely for many years, because you're not on your life path. You're not living your purpose. I was horrified, Heather. I was so embarrassed. I was just, I was like, oh my goodness, no one wants to hear that. So of course <laughs> I ask him, well, what should I be doing? What, what do I need to do? Please tell me uh, what, what's my, what's my path? What's my purpose? And he just shook, uh, just gently shook his head. So I'm like, oh boy, he's not going to tell me anything further. But I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm with my soul family here. There's other angels here. Someone's got to know. There's got to be, there's got to be a chatty Kathy in the group. Come on, you know, group, group dynamics. So I'm looking all around, um, getting more and more frantic, uh, you know, trying to find out what am I supposed to be doing or not doing? Just tell me, I want to get it right. I want to do it right. And no one, no one would tell me. So my energy is just starting to plummet what little, little life force I had left. And the group can see, because our soul family, our soul group, these are individuals that we reincarnate with many, many times. They know us the best and they know that I just need some help. So they start being hysterically funny. And they put like duct tape over their mouths when I ask them the question and just, you know, they're just, they're being really, really funny. And they're like lock and key and then they throw away the key. But again, it was so humorous. I just started to relax. And also I could feel this, you know, love and support being radiated to me. And I'm like, okay, I'm meant to figure it out myself. I get it. So uh, Michael then asked me, what do you want to do? And the minute he asked me that, all I could see was my gorgeous uh, little toddler's face, her adorable little face, her big um, hazel eyes, her brown curly hair, and I could just see her. And it wasn't like a normal size. It's like Space is different when you're home, just like time is different. It's a timeless, spaceless place, yet it's also, it's everything. It's infinite. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to put in, in words because the, the, just the concepts are different. You've probably heard this from, <laughs> from other near death death experiencers. But when he, when Archangel Michael asked me that and all I could see was Tara's face, it filled my world. The best analogy I have was it was like an IMAX screen. It's a 70 foot screen and it was like just filling my entire world in every direction. And I also knew I was going to regain my health and I knew I was going to have a healthy baby. And that new baby just meant so much to me because again, having gone through years of infertility and two ectopic pregnancy losses. So it was a big deal to be pregnant again. So when Michael asked me that, I just took a deep breath and I said, put, put me back in coach. <laughs> I'm ready to play. And I just was ready to engage in life at a, at a deeper level. So everybody gave me another huge group hug because they were so excited and just so impressed with the courage that it takes for us to incarnate and to come here and to go through the veil of amnesia and to go through the density and the challenges that we go through but also just just the the beauty of it and how we progress uh, through that and all the amazing things that happen in our lives so i get this huge group hug and that time i realize i'm getting a download of energy as well as that love and that support so i'm back down on the escalator michael um, sends me back down i'm looking over my shoulder and just waving and thanking everybody and they're all like in cheerleader mode like you can do it <laughs> you know we'll we'll be we'll be with you and i just 
um, just went like straight back into the hospital room and then the light just started fading away and I just went plop right back into my body. It was very gentle. It was very easy. I felt so honored that I got such a respectful choice and I got to make the, the choice because now that I have heard a lot of near-death experiences, so many people talk about being told it's not your time, you have to go back and being pushed or shoved. I didn't have any of that experience. So I'm back in my body and I had two thoughts. The first was, oh, she's so little. Why is she so danged little? Why did I choose such a small body? I'm five two, and I just find it um, annoying at times. <laughs> I just want to, be, want to be taller and want to be taller and, and bigger. It's so fun, but you know, so funny, but you know, Hey, it's got its advantages too. You don't bump your head anywhere. Right. <laughs> so I'm back in my body and just readjusting to how small it feels because I think our souls are so big and so beautiful that we're, we're coming into our bodies with a, a, a small percent of our energy because there's way too much a soul essence to fit into any one incarnation. So I'm back in my body and I'm also, I'm like, oh, I'm in so much pain. Oh, wow. So I'm back to that again. But I'd had the reprieve and I had just learned so much. And I was so grateful for who I'd, who I'd seen at home too, because five people really stood out when I met with my soul family. My grandparents were up at the front and I kind of expected to see my, um, maternal, my mom's parents there, because I knew them really well. I had lived with them. I'd been very close with them my whole life and they had passed on. So that, that wasn't um, a shock to me. I was, I was really happy to see them, but I also met, re-met my dad's parents, my paternal grandparents. I knew exactly who they were. I could talk with them just as well. And that was amazing to me because I never met them in this lifetime. They died before I was born. So that was a big deal too. And that just, you know, showed me other things. Like I said, that we can recognize everyone by their unique soul um, energy and we're never going to miss anyone. It's not like they've incarnated and we don't get to reunite because that higher soul essence is there. Also, one of the front and center who came forward first was um, one of my best friends. She is very much alive, but it was her higher self. So I was like, oh, that's interesting too. So I also, I also learned that and recognized, recognized her. And she's been a best friend many times. She's been my mother many times. So that was just a big deal to get to reunite with her um, also. So that's what happened. And I then, of course, did have that successful surgery the next day. They uh, must have been doing some uh, guided guided imaging to um, try and, uh, you know, avoid that the, the fetus and to just see what was what was going on. And what the doctor told me they found was what had actually ruptured was the fundus. And the fundus is an aorta at the top of the uterus. So that's why I was losing so much blood so quickly because it was an aorta. That's why it was so painful. And they estimated that I lost three quarters of my blood supply. So I am so, so fortunate that I got such assistance, incredible divine assistance, as well as Western medicine assistance that my husband got me to the hospital so quickly. I mean, just everything, everything went right to uh, get me the, the care that I needed to be able to um, make that, you know, make that decision to, uh, to, to uh, come back and, and figure out what my purpose was. <laughs> I came back for my children. Uh, that was just so clear to me when when Michael said, you know, do you do you want to come back? Your story is incredible. And I have so many questions for you. You know, did you figure out your purpose? Oh, yes, uh, please. You said you changed your beliefs. You met the soul family. You kind of looked back at Earth. Um, you had angels. You met with Archangel Michael. So I have a lot of questions and I really want to dig into it. But can we go ahead and take that into part two? Absolutely. All right. See you there. 
Wendy had so much to share about her near-death experiences, especially the second one. And I know not all of you stick around for part two, but I'm telling you, that's when we really get into some of the good stuff. And we covered so much more, um, just really got in depth about some of the things that she saw and she experienced. And it's really interesting. So I do hope that you will come back for part two. In the meantime, I'd love to know your thoughts on what Wendy shared right now. So you can leave that in the comments. And otherwise, you can just say made it and type that in the comments. I always appreciate that when you let me know that you made it to the end of the video. And likes are always great as well. But let me just give you a peek at some of the things that we talk about in part two. And I could see, um, you know, the very bottom of their wings. Their wings were so big that they would have been, you know, dragging on the floor if they were walking, but they were, they were just floating. We choose to come here and we're going to work on certain lessons and meet certain people and have certain experiences. And, you know, you can only plan so much and then it's going to play out the way it plays out. I'm consciously aware of about 150 of my past lives. So there's that and so much more. And I'm telling you, it gets interesting. So I certainly hope you'll join me. Take care, everybody. And I hope to see you in part two. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes.